Join James Tambalebi for Ask the Expert. Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert with me, James Tambalebi. For today's edition, we'll focus on the topic mental health. Mentalhealth.gov defines mental health as our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. In addition, Wikipedia defines mental health to be the level of psychological well-being or the absence of mental illness. It is the state of someone who is functioning at a satisfactory level of emotional and behavioral adjustments. Mental health may include an individual's ability to enjoy life and to create a balance between life activities and efforts to achieve psychological resilience. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. On the other hand, mental disorders, according to the World Health Organization, WHO, comprise a broad range of problems with different symptoms. They are generally characterized by some combination of abnormal thoughts, emotions, behavior, and relationships with others. Examples of mental disorders are schizophrenia, depression, intellectual disabilities, and disorders due to drug abuse. Experts say that most of those disorders can be successfully treated. But to seek an expert view on the topic, I am here to talk to Joshua Abiyose Duncan. Good day and welcome to the program. So let's start with a definition of mental health and mental disorders. Brilliant question. Mental health, put simple for the layman in terms of definition, is that thing that affects the thoughts, the feeling, and the behavior of the individual and hinders him or her to function effectively in society because he or she does not have mastery over these three things outlined. That's around mental illness. Yeah? It's quite different or it's the twist for mental health. With mental health is the functioning thoughts, behavior and feeling that empowers you to go through your daily life activity without hindrance. It does not necessarily mean that you might not be stressed out, but the ability to overcome and do your normal activity is basically what we call mental health. And you would know as WHO defined health, it's not just merely the absence of disease. So on the end of mental health, it's not merely the absence of stress or anxiety, but it's the ability that you have to overcome all of these challenges and live a normal life. When that is in that, then it becomes mental illness or mental disability. So what are the factors responsible for mental health? Factors responsible for mental health. Put simple, I will divide them into three. Again, not to be very technical, but also to be very clear that others may understand that. One of the key causes for mental health problem is what we would call environmental problem. Yeah. Um, you would agree with me that over the gone years, let's say the 10 year old civil war that we had in Sierra Leone, the mudslide, the Ebola outbreak, now Corona has its impact on a human being. And when such affects us, the ability to be able to contain it varies from individual to individual. And when you are not strong enough to contain these challenges, it results to your ability not strong mentally to overcome this. And that's where the problem comes in. So environmental problem like crisis situation, the death of a loved one are major causes for mental health problem. But another cause is what we would call hereditary. It moves from lineage, from family member to another family member. People used to say the entire family of this sort of people are all mentally ill. Why? Because it runs through the gene. And when once that's the case, honestly, you would know that this is passed on from parents to children. The last is basically 
what we would call a natural or problematic disaster, like a road transport accident. Yeah, you fall to the ground, you hit your head, it becomes fractured, and your ability to reason is distorted, basically because of those three causes. So, early warning signs. What are those signs and symptoms? Brilliant. Of early mental illness. Warning signs about mental health disorders. Basically, you begin to observe it in three ends. First, we call what we call the physiological signs. Yeah, and the physiological science talks about your physical makeup. Now, firstly, you are not excited anymore to do your normal exercise. Your eating ability either increases or reduces. You sleep a lot. You have headache. These are physiological problems. And sometimes you go to the hospital and you'll be treated for even things like back pain. And yet it's not moving away. It's not responding to the medication you take. You begin to wonder what's happening. Possibly you assume it's typhoid and you're treating typhoid and nothing seems to be working. These are physiological signs. But you have also those signs that we would call a social sign, sociological. It talks about you withdrawing from your normal life. You used to go out with friends to watch football matches. You used to go out on sports and other activity. Now your interest in that one is gone. You used to sit at the sitting room with your family and watch TV. You have no interest in that anymore. You used to talk with friends, even those you think are your close friends, your spouse or your, or your partner. No more interest in it. There is this cut between you and society. And when these wedges show up, it's a sign, it's a marker that something is not right socially or emotionally. And the last is what we would call a psychological. You begin to lose touch with reality. Some people may even hear voices. Some people may see things. And some people may begin to assume that I am what I really am not. Basically because you begin to imagine you are the president of a whole country. Your touch with your mind, with your psychological makeup is being tinted by some other strange feelings and thoughts. And when that happens, honestly, these are signs and you really need to take note of it. You're listening to Ask the Expert with James Tamba Levy. So let's move on. I know there are types of mental illnesses or mental disorders. Can you throw light on those types? Wow, types of mental disorders. Great. Honestly, when you talk about mental disorder, a lot of people would go to worst case scenario. And this has affected our perception over time. Mental health disorder starts from things as easy as stress, anxiety, depression, abnormal grieving. Then you go to things like psychosis. You go to things like schizophrenia, substance abuse. These are all categories of mental health problems that exist in our community. But we realize that the highest percentage of mental health problems affecting people not only in Sierra Leone but the world around is depression. It is called the silent killer and a lot of people are not aware of it. So we realize that those case scenarios, seeing individuals walking in the street suffering from psychosis, lost in touch with reality, or those dressing in a colorful fashion, yet I mean, we see them and we say, no, this something is not right with them. Basically, we always see those situations. But those silent killer like depression, anxiety, mood swing, personality disorders, these ones, people don't see them as early as possible. But you know, learning disability is also another condition. And a lot of time, we do not see them. We rather call them names. But honestly, the condition varies and are great and manifest in different ways in terms of behavior, in terms of emotion, and in terms of psychological makeup. So is there a nexus between poverty and mental illness? Whatsoever strains the mind and the mind cannot manage or contain has a link to mental health problem. So let's ask around the question of poverty. Have you ever thought for a while that an individual sitting in the office behind the computer Walking and half of the day that individual wonders, how can I pay my son's or my child's fee? 
How can I be able to pay my next year's rent? How can I be able to meet with the transport crisis? It's, it's actually an issue. Those who have enough might not worry about that. But those who don't may spend huge number of time thinking about the problem rather than working in the office. So there is a huge connection with poverty and mental health problem. Remember, stress and being anxious are part of the problems that comes as a result of poverty. And we identified them as a problem of mental health as well. So honestly, there is huge connectivity with the two. You would also realize that there had been cases when individuals in certain community, because of their poverty level, have increased tension within themselves and are expressed through fighting or through conflicts. I mean, throwing words at each other. These are all pointers, and a lot of time we are not aware of it and the impact that is in it. Earlier, you highlighted or categorized the types of mental disorders or mental illnesses. Among those types, which ones are manageable and which ones cannot be managed? Honestly, I think all of them are manageable. <laughs> People would say this individual is being written off basically because, you know, his case has been one that has caused him to go on the streets. It's always not so. Every one of them can be manageable. There are two ways you can manage them. Yeah, Whether psychosis, whether schizophrenia, whether depression, whether anxiety, two ways. The first is talking therapy. And for me, this is where we are missing. Even sometimes when we seek physically, we jump for medication instead of looking at things like rest, drinking water, doing some exercise. Because our orientation over time has pointed to the fact that until you take pills or tablets or you take IV or you take intramuscular shots, you will not do well. It's not so. For mental health issues, we say in a local dialect, a listening ear is medicinal to a heart that is full of stress. So basically, sit and listen and allow the individual to unburden all the stressors or the issues that causes stress on him or her. And that's already a way forward. In the case we are talking, therapy does not work. Your next step is you look at medication, but at a smaller dose, do not go too complex. Start small and grow small. This is what the clinician say. Let's move forward and look at the impact of emergencies. I know you, you touch on that, the environmental effects or causes. But what's the, the connection of how, how do emergencies, natural or public health emergencies, contribute once more? to mental health disorders? Oh, we look at the pre, we look at the during, and we look at the post. Pre, there are those already full of stress before the emergency. And when the emergency comes, it escalates it. That's, a one, that's one major problem. You are there, your source of livelihood has been quite challenging. Then comes in emergency with its restrictions and its, you know, its impact on you. Then it increases the tension within to manage all of the stresses around. And that would increase your problem. But remember, there are those who are already sick before the emergency. And in a crisis situation, fear shows up. And even those who provide services, as in the case of Corona, are very careful in getting in direct touch with those who are already sick. So you realize that those gaps are there and might lead to what we call relapse. And when these individuals relapse, to get them again under control is a huge challenge. But when you are also in the crisis situation and things are not meeting as you expect them to work, all around you it seems like blockade. Yeah, You are asked to drop out of the job for a moment because you know I, we, we cannot pay business, it's not working. And I have a lot to do. Feeding is an everyday thing. How do you cope with that? So you realize some people are of the opinion that during lockdown, conflict among family members increases because a hungry man is an angry man. So during a crisis situation, it's always hard to manage. Also, the issue of uncertainty. When will this end? How would I have my liberty again to access 
my cinema hall where I would watch the games I used to watch and undo the stresses I have. It's there. How do you cope? So you find out that the level of stress and anxiety increases and shoots up. And if it is not well managed over a given period of time, it results to something else. But after, I know you may have heard about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. With the 10-year rebel war, with the outbreak of Ebola, with the mudslide, with corona, you begin to imagine after all of this crisis, when this situation begins to shoot up, because at the early stage or during the crisis, it might seem as if you are able to handle it. But just after, and these things begin to shoot up after the crisis, then the huge challenge comes up. How do we manage it? When the service providers themselves are overwhelmed, when, when family members are knocked off, the community support is missing, how would we respond to post-traumatic stress disorder? Then they resort to taking substance, as a means to calm down their stress, yet having a multiple rippling effect on them. You're listening to Ask the Expert with James Tamba Levy. Groups that are susceptible, vulnerable groups in terms of mental disorder. Oh, people, people with disabilities issues are already suffering from exclusion. Then crisis situation comes. And so when exclusion has already taken place around people with disability and this crisis situation comes, they are never the priority. But also let's look at women and girls. Honestly, children specifically by extension. We remember that this in our society, except in recent times, consideration are not given to them. Yeah, husband will undo all of their stress on their wives and they expect the wives to contain all. And in cases where the wives are not able, they carry it down further to the children. And who can speak on their behalf? A society is so male conscious and so biased sometimes that they do not understand the huge burden women, girls and children to be general are going through. These are major issues. Yeah, people in poor areas in the slums, how do they make it up? But let me shock you a bit. People who are also wealthy but are gripped with fear can also be victim. They might not even want to go out to the bank for fear that they might be affected. What's of it all? The aged in this case of Corona. So it's, it's quite evident that there are a lot of sets, yet those that are major are women, children and other disability groups. Okay, let's look at how stigma affects mental illnesses. How does it perpetuate it? For me, it's, it's almost the same side of a coin. In our culture, when they say mental health disability, it's a stigma all by itself. The names we call them, as if they are the ones that, I mean, appealed to the gods that they should be victim of such circumstances. I mean, we treat them as if they do not have rights to marry, we consider them as dependent and so therefore they are financial deficit to our society. We do not even realize that they feel and sometimes they would want to participate. Let me give you an instance. How many times have we gotten family meetings and have also created a forum for people with mental disability to, to be part of that forum? It's easy for them to say, just get out here. What can you say in such a gathering? Stigma has destroyed them so much so that they are not ever even able to come out and speak in society because of the condition they face. It's quite challenging that everyone in society are not taught as to how to ridicule a man with mental health disability. It's natural because societal role has informed everyone coming up that in society, even among disability groups, mental health is the worst in terms of stigmatization. Can you quantify the impact of mental health on society in terms of development, in terms of productivity, in terms of growth? Quantifying it might not be something easy in Sierra Leone, but I want to introduce what we call the ROI report. It's talking about return 
on investment. There has been the study that if you invest in an individual with mental health problem and that person is adequately managed, his or her contribution can form up to 4% of national development in any country. This is gotten from the Speak Your Mind campaign in the UK. And the study was taken for over 15 countries, including us, Sierra Leone. And so the pointer here is a lot of the challenge we face at national level is basically because we do not invest in our staff when they are stressed. We do not invest in our staff when they are depressed. We do not invest in our staff when they are anxious. We find the best way to get them out. And when you get them out, you get them out with their experience and skills because they may have worked in your institution for a longer time. And then you bring somebody fresh and new who has to go through the process. And that individual is out of the system and is becoming a dependent on his or her family. So it becomes an extra burden. Our voice over the years has been, please empower them when they are sick, as in the case of typhoid and malaria. Take them to the nearest mental health unit in all of the district hospital that has been established since 2015. And let them have access to care. Let them have access to the kind of care they need to do well. But another problem which is in the, on the flip end is basically the problem of what role does community actors, what role does family member play for people who are mentally ill? And the question is, a lot of discrimination and stigma takes over the position of love and warmth. I used to tell people a story. Two individuals were sick. The one was really well to do and was in a private room. And the one wasn't. And he was in the general ward. But what happened while that one in the private room has all its medication and food, the one in the general ward actually does not have all but have a lot of visitor and warmth. And the recovery process over time shows that the presence of your family members and friends help build your inner resilience. And when it is built up, honestly, your body makeup generates that kind of energy that helps you to overcome whatsoever is keeping you aback. And to a large extent, it's response to health. So I want to say, honestly, it affects us so much. And we need to invest on the individual for national development. So we do not only look at those who are basically sick and cannot contribute to life. We look at those we think are doing well because they are giving the world the sunshine, yet they are being eaten up by the stressors around them. Perhaps finally, measures, short term, medium term, long term for addressing challenges of mental disorders. I know you've spoken on some of them, but throw light on more. I will look at three basic mediums. First, capacity building. Honestly, you cannot chart for a cure without first diagnosing what the illness is. If we do have the number of service providers that provide service for those with mental health disorders, Honestly, the return on investment will proportionately increase. In the gone years, we trained 21 mental health nurses. We, we, we lost two. Okay? And we have 19. And honestly, for a population of over 6 million, with just two psychiatrists in the, in the country, and 21 mental health nurses, with just two or four at the psychiatric hospital, and one or almost two at most in all of the districts, can they serve a population of that number? Our drive is let's have the professional in the field who will be able to provide the services. The second point is right policies and legislation. Honestly, the legislation we have is the oldest in Africa. It was written in 1902. Can you imagine what mental health in modern times speaks when you compare with mental health in those primitive times? 1902. It takes all the rights of the individual and converts what we call the psychiatric hospital into an asylum. So when you go there, it's to be kept semi-prisoner instead of being treated. And no matter how we renovate and work at the psychiatric hospital, 
If that document does not speak to the current trend, then legally we are operating under that kind of system. And honestly, it does not create the climate for mental health to thrive in the country. So legislation and policy, let it speak. Let us don't have the letter alone. Let's have the spirit and the transformation of the letter into action. And the last point I would want to bring is the role of the community. Honestly, we say also in our local dialect, even a broken, a broken boat that is at the seashore has an owner. And so if anyone, every one of us rises up and take our mentally ill patient to one of these units for care, the fight around how can we get them off the streets will be solved. Because mental illness is part of the general illness as defined by WHO. It is either a physical, a social, or a mental problem that brings illness according to the definition of WHO. So let family members be a contributing factor by having the right awareness. The role of you people is great for this. I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful for this interview because you people are doing exactly what the third point requires. Let the community know mental health problems are not always demonic problems or the spirit of genes and genii. It also has its physiological and psychological effect as a result of stressors in society. Let community actors rise up. Let family members, let the religious institutions rise up and appreciate these individuals and ensure that they embrace them and ensure inclusion. I tell you for free, within years, the development and the economic growth we would have in this country will be far-reaching and cannot be overemphasized. Thank you for talking to me, sir. It's a pleasure. I'm very grateful to also talk to you and the rest of society. You've been listening to Ask the Expert with me, James Tambalebi. The topic of discussion was mental health and mental disorders. And my expert was Joshua Abiyose Duncan. He is the head of the Mental Health Coalition and Speak Your Mind campaign, Sierra Leone. Keep listening. Tune into Radio Mount Oral FM 107.3 every Monday after the 8 p.m. News Bulletin and on Saturdays after the 7 a.m. News Bulletin for Ask the Expert. <laughs>